for COVID misinformation. Can you hear me now, mate? Can you hear me now? Right? Tucker's irony is last done on a quarter of his audience, says Elliot Blatt. This is irresponsible, Mr. Ford. Tucker is going to kill people. Trump's best thing was his coining of fake news and blasting the liberal news media. Fake news keeps on working. Surely the pandemic can be blamed on Trump. The recession will be blamed on Trump too. The art of the jab. Okay, so so uh, let's let's get let's get stuck into it. All right, this is a high quality show. What you really want to know is, you know, what what's going on with with the Atlantic right now. So. So let, let's talk about what's going on with the Atlantic. And you're wondering, like, what, what constitutes a super friend? All right? Right? For making friends can be intimidating, particularly as an adult. But uh, there, there are people who balance bustling social calendars, who, you know, seem to have, have lots and lots of friends. Hey, cut out, cut out the music here. I'm trying to run, it, run a, a quality show. So you're wondering, like, what the hell is going on with, you know, with the Atlantic? What, what does the Atlantic have to say about super friends? Like, enough with the Tucker Carlson medical misinformation. Let's get to the good stuff, right? Super friends tend to have one quality in common, and that enables them to flourish outside their relationships too. So it is the background that the news might be blowing your mind. It's like it may be causing, you know, great anxiety. Like what the hell, dude? I, I don't understand what, what's going on in South Africa. I don't understand what's going on in LA or New York. All right. So the news might be blowing your mind and the way to deal with the anxiety that comes from having, you know, unexplainable thoughts and feelings is that you develop more accurate hypotheses and more hypotheses about how the world works so that you can feel more calm. All right, super friends, all right? They have better mental health. They're more satisfied at work. They're more open to new ideas. They are less prejudiced. They feel less regret than uh, most people. They endure stressful events more effectively, they keep calm. They're less likely to have physical ailments such as heart attacks, headaches, ulcers, and inflammation. All right? What is the distinguishing quality of super friends? You ask. It is a secure attachment. All right, secure attachment. That is the gut feeling that we project onto ambiguity in our interactions. All right. So the world is infinitely more complicated than we think. Right, that we want to believe. All right, we we can only kind of get a handle on this or that aspect. All right, our our ability to understand the world around us is largely contingent upon the world around us fitting into uh, certain of our hypotheses that work under certain circumstances. All right, so attachment—that's the gut feeling we project onto ambiguity in our interaction. So it's not driven by some cool assessment of the news but by the collapsing of time the super super imposition of the past into the present so if we understand our attachment style all right we can gain more control over ourselves and our world we can recognize how we contribute to our own relationship problems we can try to change course towards greater security and stronger friendships all right so my attachment style has long been anxious i tend to have way more anxiety about relationships than would be healthy. So there are three main attachment styles, secure, anxious, and avoidant. So secure people assume that they're worthy of love. And we can all work towards becoming more and more secure in our attachment. It's not like we just develop an attachment style early on and then we're just stuck with that for life. All right, so we can all work towards secure attachment. So secure attachment people feel that they are worthy of love and that others can be trusted to give it to them. People who are anxiously attached, that's been my history, assume that others will abandon them. So I sort of have like abandonment wired into my thinking, into my DNA, I expect to be abandoned. So anxious people like me will cling, we will try too hard to accommodate others, or we will plunge into intimacy way too rapidly. And let me tell you, when I moved to Los Angeles at age 27, I plunged into intimacy way too rapidly in my first two years in particular. Avoidantly attached people are afraid of abandonment, but instead of clinging, they keep others at a distance. 
Okay, so here is a term, paranoia, all right? That's when you think, you know, the world's out to get you. And the opposite of paranoia is a term called pronoia, all right? That's the optimistic counterpart to paranoia. So people with pronoia possess the delusion that other people want what's best for them, right? And presuming goodwill isn't always a mistake, right? Unless there's contradictory evidence, right? Secure people tend to assume that others are trustworthy. And I notice this, I, I get through life and it's like, wow, you know, some people are just really trustworthy of, you know, other seemingly decent people, right? So you'd think that, that secure people therefore set themselves up for disappointments. And, uh, not so much. If you trust people, you trust decent people, generally speaking, you make people more trustworthy. If you indicate to people you don't trust them, you make them less trustworthy. All right? So when unsecure, when unworthy people weasel through the cracks and cause harm, secure people tend to be less affected than the insecure. So a strong predictor of resilience and stress regulation is having secure attachment. So you get resilience, you get good faith, and secure people, therefore, free to take up risks in relationships. So they're more likely to initiate new friendships, to productively address conflict, and share intimate things about themselves. People like me who have a history towards anxious attachment, we have a harder time trusting that these risks won't end in hurt. So we become much more physically sensitive to snubs. All right, so... When you are more generous with other people, you know, using common sense, they will tend to be more generous with you. So anxiously attached people commonly misfire. So this one woman left, left her job and a colleague sent her a kind farewell email and she responded with brevity and the other person got so ticked off that he just sent her a whole series of nasty tests and he didn't realize that she had just been diagnosed with with cancer right and so he spent a whole bunch of time kicking her while, while she was down right we, we never have full information right we always have to infer why people behave a certain way so the stories we tell ourselves about the world about the news about other people are all come from our attachment styles and they frequently don't line up with the truth so anxious people and that's been my tendency will tend to see rejection where it's not really there. They're just primed to feel rejection. So anxious people are so vigilant for rejection and dismissal that they register cues of it while ignoring signals of acceptance. People who have avoidant attachment will end up pushing others away for fear of rejection. They're much more likely to end friendships and romantic relationships. So avoidant people may appear cool and collected during times of strife, but their nervous systems are frenzied and their blood pressure is spiking. So insecure attachment is a way that people like me have used to protect myself from the hazards of connection, but it is a system gone away. When people cling to themselves, it harms them. Right? When people keep others at a distance to protect themselves, that also harms them. All these forms of self-protection become self-harm. And I remember telling my therapist that I need my blog so that I can protect myself against people who want to take advantage of me. And my, my therapist said, maybe you'll only get well, maybe you'll only heal once you put down your weapons, meaning my blog. So most of us aren't just secure, insecure, or avoidant. We're insecure at certain times, secure in other situations. But if we grow towards security, we become a better friend and a better friend to ourselves. How bold one gets when one is sure of being loved, says Sigmund Freud. I mean, I'm feeling the love right now and how bold I'm about to get. So the more positively we feel about ourselves, the more likely we are to assume that others like us too. When people assume that others like them, this acts as a self-fulfilling prophecy, the acceptance prophecy. If people expect acceptance, they will behave warmly, which leads other people to accept them. If they expect rejection, they will behave coldly, which will lead to less acceptance. Okay. So I just uh, saw on Twitter a link to a, an academic study from 2019 about cynicism. Luke, pick one. Cassidy Hutchinson or Courtney from yesterday if she was sig single. I would go with Courtney. Courtney, that is my type. 
How about doing a seven-day bean diet? 70, 40 days eating only canned beans. I have a very respectable ban. All right. I don't have the gas attacks that I used to have because I, I think once I got on the beef organ capsules, uh, the, those gas attacks have largely become a thing of the past. Look, why so much Washington Post instead of the Washington Times? The Washington Times is some moony paper. The Washington Post is 20 times uh, as good as the Washington Times. Now, I just saw the new Top Gun movie. That is a fun movie. I mean, I couldn't believe how emotionally moved I was by by the new Top Gun movie. I mean, it really like pushed my buttons. It just felt good the whole time. Now, I primed myself by watching the old Top Gun movie. And it, yeah, it was fine. It, it was an enjoyable movie. But this new Top Gun movie is just so much fun. All right, the cynical genius illusion, guys, exploring and debunking lay beliefs about cynicism and competence. All right, so most people think that cynical people are smarter and more competent, but a cynical attitude is only adaptive in certain situations. All right, those people who embrace cynicism unconditionally, right, they're not so effective in life. So cynicism means a negative appraisal of human nature. It's a belief that self-interest is the ultimate motive behind all human actions, even seemingly good ones, and the people will go to any lengths to satisfy it. So holding a cynical view of human nature has been associated with bad health outcomes, increased mortality risk, lower psychological well-being, diminished self-esteem, and reduced economic well-being. So I think it's useful to have an accurate view of human nature, and that is people not only have tendencies towards bad, but people also have tendencies towards good. So many people think being cynical is wiser than not being cynical enough. But studies show that people typically earn more money if they're willing to trust strangers. If you believe that people will accept you, you will tend to be warmer when you interact with other people. Then when you're warmer with other people, they will tend to treat you more warmly. So cynical people, generally speaking, earn lower incomes due to their ineptitude for cooperation. Cynicism, not so smart in terms of financial success. Cynicism tends to be a worldview endorsed by individuals with lower levels of education. Intelligent individuals tend to have lower levels of self-interest and to be more trustworthy. Higher levels of education and competence help individuals detect and avoid potential deceit in the first place, thus reducing the probability of negative social experiences, which contributes to a more positive view of human nature. So general cognitive ability tends to be negatively related to cynical hostility. Come on, do you feel the love? Cynical individuals are likely to do worse on cognitive tasks, cognitive abilities, and competency tests. They tend to be less educated than the less cynical. When people endorse a cynical stance concerning others and forego trust, they usually do not get a chance to learn whether their untrustworthiness assumption was correct. So being cynical spared them a loss, but it may also have denied them a win. So cynicism often precludes the possibility of experiencing negative outcomes. So what might be perceived as smarter by being cynical, but cynical people tend to have lower levels of competence compared to their less cynical partners. Now, there are a lot of witty and smart cynics in fiction, and so this kind of fuels the cynical genius illusion. So the primary goal of fiction is entertainment. So fictional worlds are typically more dangerous. The villains are meaner and the cost of mistakes are higher than in reality. So as Barack Obama said with regard to the House of Cards series on Netflix, life in Washington is a little more boring than what is displayed on the screen. So in hostile and dangerous worlds created for our entertainment, cynicism is warranted and often turns out to be essential for survival. But overall, the idea of cynical individuals being more competent, intelligent, and experienced than less cynical ones tends to be largely illusory. As Stephen Colbert, TV host, phrases it, cynicism masquerades as wisdom, but it is the furthest thing from it. So let's see if uh, Tucker is on, on a better wicket here. Okay. Tucker Carlson. This is a Fox News alert, and we're not overselling that. This actually is a blockbuster story. So the CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, just went on the Joe Rogan podcast. And while speaking to Rogan, 
He admitted that Facebook censored the New York Post's accurate reporting on Hunter Biden's laptop, which, of course, we all knew. But that Facebook did that because the FBI intervened and told Facebook that that laptop was Russian disinformation. And, of course, how would Zuckerberg know? They believe the FBI. Now, keep in mind, the FBI had Hunter Biden's laptop when they said that. They've had it since 2019. So when the FBI told Facebook that on the eve of a presidential election, they knew it was a lie. They interfered in the last presidential election. If ever there was an attack on democracy, it's the country's largest law enforcement agency weighing in in a dishonest way three weeks before the voting begins. Here's a clip. There was a lot of attention on Twitter during the election because of the Hunter Biden laptop story, the New York Post. Yeah, we had that too. Yeah, so you guys censored that as well? So we took a different path than Twitter. Um, I mean, basically, the background here is the FBI, I think, basically came to us, uh, some some folks on our team, and was like, hey— um, just so you know, like you should be on high alert. There was the, we we thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have it on notice that basically there's about to be some kind of dump of of um, uh, that's similar to that. So just be vigilant. So the FBI censored the story. Just to recap, in case you didn't live in this country prior to two years ago, that's not allowed. You're not allowed to do that. That is election interference. That is an attack on democracy by our most powerful domestic government agency. It's unbelievable. It defies belief. We actually put in a request to Facebook to see the communications from the FBI to Facebook. We have a right to see it. We hope that they'll send them to us. Keep in mind that in, in October of 2020, a Facebook executive and Democratic Party operative called Andy Stone claim that Facebook was blocking the story, quote, as part of our standard process to reduce the spread of misinformation. So they didn't tell us that the FBI had told them it was Russian disinformation. Again, when the FBI knew perfectly well that it wasn't. Harmeet Dillon has watched all of this from the very beginning. She's the country's premier civil rights lawyer, founder of the Center for American Liberty, joining us tonight. Harmeet, thanks for coming on. Okay, so you're probably wondering, 40, you know, let's, let's just skip past the news, right? G- give us the real intellectual meat of your life. And so did you know the brain has a mind of its own attachment, neurobiology, and the new science of psychotherapy? So this is a book written by a professor, Jeremy Holmes. It just came out in in 2020 and a lot of good stuff in here and and applies to understanding the news. So number one, we live in an entropic universe, right? The, The world around us is continually tending towards chaos. So broken cups, for example, they don't spontaneously reassemble. Coffee gets colder once it's poured, the stars burn out. The, the one, one exception to entropy and chaos is life itself. So the quantum physicist Schrodinger coined the term negentropy to describe how living matter reverses this cosmic tide toward a disorder and homogeneity. So negentropy is, the, is really homeostasis. It is the quest for order. So the condition of a free life is the stability of an interior milieu. So homeostasis resists the forces of chaos, entropy, physiologically and behaviorally. So inherent in homeostasis are boundaries. All right, you want homeostasis at home, you need to build a wall. You want homeostasis in your nation state, you need to build a wall. All right, strong boundaries are the key to order. All right, and so... In, in our cells, we have cell mem- membranes, we have the skin, we have the brain within its skull. So homeostasis faces outward towards the environment and inwards towards our interior. So temperature sensors in our skin tell us if it's hot. The sympathetic nervous system then activates sweat glands. The brain tells us to move into the shade. It's all in the service of resisting getting you know, fried. So homeo stats vary in precision some are highly sensitive others tolerate a great deal of variation so the brain's job is to counteract entropy and to maintain internal stability on behalf of the organisms whose processes and behaviors it controls and directs so our sense organs external and internal are constantly bombarded by a vast range of stimuli from an ever-changing environment so to cooperate 
cooperate with maximum efficiency, the brain is constantly selecting meaning out of all the sensations it's processing. And then the brain only attends to those that are relevant to its particular ecological niche and especially to input that is out of the ordinary, that is novel. So let's get a little something here from uh, South Africa. I, I understand uh, that you don't like Julius Malema and you don't like what he says. And that's fine. That's your democratic right. He's a divisive person. I think we can accept that. But isn't this also, this entire court case, which has gone on for so many years, isn't it really about building your constituency? Let me, let me explain what I mean. You will attack Malema. There'll be a court case. He attacks you back. That's his right, too. All that does is make you strong on the one side and him strong on the other side. You both get stronger by dividing our society. Isn't that immoral? Uh, Stephen, this is, uh, it's funny that we have to keep having this conversation. Um, the, it, what you're suggesting is that Julius Malema would not have, have a platform, would not have been allowed to, to organize protest rallies with 12,000 people showing up if it wasn't for Afri Forum somehow giving him a platform that he somehow didn't have before this court case. This is, he's probably the most famous politician in the country or one of the most famous politicians in Africa and certainly one of the most influential politicians in, in, in the country. To try to suggest that somehow he didn't have a platform and now he's being given a platform because we're taking him to court is is – is just misleading, I think, to put it very, very mildly. The fact of the matter is that he has a massive platform. He organizes protest rallies and th thousands of people shows up. They organize manifesto launches and they fill stadiums. And then he chants things like, kill the boy, kill the farmer. And then he says, we're going to slit the throat of whiteness and all whites are criminals and they should be treated as such. And one day I might ask you to go out and kill all those white people. And now we're the ones trying to stop this. And now somehow that makes us the bad guys. I think that's that's the unfortunate thing about the narrative, the media narrative that we have in this country, is standing up to something that is obviously wrong, that obviously shouldn't happen, somehow makes you the bad guy. It's, it's very unfortunate that we are in this situation. And I think journalists like you should try to point to the other side of the argument as well. Ernst Ritz, thank you for the advice from Afri Forum. Okay, so in chanting, kill the boar, singing, kill the boar, kill the farmer, all right? That's not hate speech, according to... South African court. So. Malema, Economic Freedom Front singing Kill the Boar ruled not hate speech. Offrey Forum has indicated that it will appeal the judgment made by the Equality Court. The Equality Court dismissed, with costs, Offrey Forum's complaint against the Economic Freedom Fighters, EFF, and its president, Julius Malema and their singing Kill the Boar, Kill the Farmer on multiple occasions between 2016 and 2019. Offrey Forum filed a complaint to have the two songs, Du Boulevenu. Shoot the Boar, and Biza Amafa Rebrigade, Call the Fire Brigade, declared hate speech and unfair discrimination in terms of the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act, the Equality Act. Offrey f okay, so in, in essence, uh, singing about murdering white people, not considered hateful according to South African law. So, the song. Amanda! Our two! Look, I don't agree with the messages here, but it is a catchy tune. You are a boor, a white man. You're going to hit them. The cabinet is so 
It would seem inconceivable that the bearer of the highest office of state could utter these words without attracting international outrage, and yet no significant outrage followed the then president's singing of this song. Later that year, the ANC Youth League Deputy President Ronald Lamola, who would later become the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services in the Ramaphosa Cabinet, said during a press conference, and I quote, I am just giving a warning to white South Africans. They must voluntarily bring back the land and voluntarily bring back the mineral resources. There will be a moment when these service delivery protests will invade the land of Mr. Van Tonder and Mr. Van der Merwe, and we can no longer be able to guarantee the continued safety of Mr. Van der Merwe. Those names that he used are just stereotypical Afrikaner or farmer names. During the ANC's 2013 election campaign, Cyril Ramaphosa, the then Deputy President of South Africa, told people that they should vote for the ANC, otherwise the Boers will come back into power, presumably to oppress black people. In March 2017, during a session of the National Assembly, where the crisis of farm murders was discussed for the first time in the South African Parliament, ANC Member of Parliament Duduzile Promise Manana shouted, bury them alive, during a speech by a leader of the opposition party in which he pleaded for prioritizing of government's reaction to farm murders. Julius Malema, former ANC Youth League president, who would later break Okay, so Tucker Carlson is talking to Andrew Tate. I'm not a, I'm not a fan of Andrew Tate, but he does say some wise things on occasion. Boxer has built up a truly enormous following on social media. Until a couple months ago, we'd never heard of him. And then the other day, virtually every tech company on the planet banned him. Not just his presence, but also his ability to conduct business on the Internet. He was taken off Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, all of it. Then they started telling you that not only was he not allowed to talk, but that you weren't allowed to like him because he was an incredibly bad person. And our view on that always is we'll decide for ourselves since we're adults and Americans and we'll listen to anyone we want and we'll come to any conclusion we care to come to about what that person is about. So we sat down at some length and talked to Andrew Tate and we wanted to show you some of it so you could make up your own mind, which you're still allowed to do as far as we're concerned. Here's part of the interview. I don't really feel like I've exposed anything. Like I'm truly not a very political person. This is the first time someone's experienced this level of ban. I'm not particularly right wing. I don't vote. I mean, I obviously have my own personal views, but they didn't ban me for that. Um, they banned me simply because I had large swaths of the population agreeing to very traditional masculine values, teenage men and young, and young men, 20, 30, 22, 23, 24, were looking up to me and aspiring to be like me. I have a very traditionally masculine life. I have fast cars and a big house and, and a lot of money and a beautiful girlfriend. And they thought they thought this was very, very threatening. And for some reason, they decided that it's better if they annihilate me from the internet and replace me with somebody who's more aligned with whatever they're trying to purport. Tell us what your message is to young men. Yeah, so I think that being a man is very, very difficult. I think that men's issues are largely overlooked. The people in charge of the world pretend to care, but when somebody who's champion, champion, championing men's issues like myself comes forward and finally manages to garner huge percentiles of the public support, I'm silenced. So, Okay, that's just a, a softball interview. I mean, Andrew Tate has said and done a lot of heinous things. And, uh, I just want the world to know in my final statement that if you're a supporter of mine, and I know most of you are, please explain the truth in a respectful manner. Telling these hate-filled people that they're wrong and calling them names won't help. These people are not happy people because happy people don't act that way. Tell them the truth. Show them that the content is out of context. Show them the long format content. Say all the ways I've helped you. And I really believe by being a genuinely professional, logical, positive person, you guys can change public consciousness for me. And 
Time is a beautiful thing. It's amazing how things change with time. And in the meantime, I'm going to enjoy my fantastic life, which I've managed to build with all of the tenacity and mental strength that I try and teach my fans. You know how to reach me. And I'll finish with a quote from my late father. My unmatched perspicacity, coupled with sheer indefatigability, makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. Andrew Tate apparently has been canceled all over the place because uh, he had fans based off of misogynistic posts, hateful things, uh, calls to potential violence towards women. Uh, this guy was all over the place and now he appears to not be over all over the place anymore. Um, so yes, this already was breaking this week, but now there's a few more responses. He's had a little bit of sympathetic uh, uh, supporters on his side that even invited them on their show for him to explain or even talk about the predicament that he's in. You might not be surprised as the first guy who said, come on, let's talk about it, Andrew. But when they go to cancel you, ladies and gentlemen, it comes hard and fast. You lose your Facebook, then your Instagram, then your Gmail, then your Discord, then your website hosting, then your domain name, like then your payment processor, then your bank. Then like it's just like in real time, you're watching your phone and apps just exploding. Boom, boom, boom. It's kind of how those things work. I'm not sure how the bank account part works, but apparently you're completely eliminated and alienated from society. You now have to live on the streets. So Natucker Carlson will definitely not have you on anymore. Uh, anyways, just to give you an idea of who he was, because maybe it was a quick explanation. Maybe you didn't hear about the types of things he said, just like I didn't before. Here's a little glimpse as to who Andrew Tate is. Do you think that women are property? So I think my sister is her husband's property. I'm not saying anything new. I'm not saying anything which is really, truly even controversial. The whole world agreed that the woman belongs to the man when she decides to give herself to a man. Okay, so that in and of itself is not, not heinous because, yeah, a, a woman, you would expect if you love someone and you're in a serious relationship with, with, with someone, yeah, you do have sort of an ownership over them as she does over you. It works in the other direction too. Slap, slap, grab, choke, shut up, bitch, sack. Who knows CPR? Well, okay, that's, that's not the best. Me? Help him. No. Why? Because I ain't gay. It's like a lot of fun. And in fact, of course, you know who it's attracted. Bunch of young folks and maybe even some incels. Let's go to some details. Okay, let's get back to the, the heavy duty material for which this, this uh, show is so renowned. All right, so the world outside is constantly tending to chaos. We want to be constantly tending towards homeostasis, towards order, all right? So our brain is continually estimating the likelihood of future events, all right? We're continually calculating probabilities. We, we compare the current state of affairs with past occurrences. We estimate the extent of correspondence between what happened in the past, what's likely to happen in the future. We factor in the likelihood of error, both memory and perception. We end up with a portion that represents that which cannot be predicted. So prediction error, we try to minimize as much as possible. Prediction error minimization, PEM. So the brain top down uses Bayesian, that means statistical probabilities to clarify bottom up input, right? Stuff that's going on inside of you, right? My stomach is complaining, but it's not surprising I overdid it on the pudding, so it's probably not cancer, right? I know that too, and I've heard it so many times. Yes, of course, it's the Beatles Yellow Submarine. Is that a stick or a snake? Come on, there aren't any snakes in city centers. It's probably safe to pick up. So in this formulation, energy equals chaotic information, all right? Information that's physically embodied in patterns of neuronal impulses, synaptic transmission, meaning fire together, wire together, and the neurohormonal environment. So prior models of the world, top-down models, right, try to bind, mean that they bring to heal incoming bottom-up information that you're getting from your senses and your feelings. So energy or information or news that is unbounded, that is chaotic, right, that, that uh, increases our prediction error rate, reflects novelty and chaos that needs to be controlled, to be bound, to forestall the dangers of chaos. So prediction energy error is minimized by binding bottom-up energy, right? If stuff's going on inside of you or in your senses, 
all right, that you can't make sense of, you need some kind of top-down generative model based on pre-existing patterns and concepts. This preserves order and keeps chaos at bay. So we know what we like and we see what we want and what we expect to see. But there's always going to be a discrepancy between our pre-existing models of the world and our incoming sensations. There'll always be an excess of information and energy that cannot be bound, meaning controlled, and will have to be passed on to the next level up of the hierarchy. So we don't, except for in times of lockdown, live in the huddled dark rooms. The environment around us is constantly in flux, so we need to explore as much as conserve to find new sources of food, suitable mates, friends, interests, and excitement. So surprise... Right, is a proxy for chaos. Right, surprise is vital to survival, but it is potentially catastrophic, chaotic, disruptive, even life-threatening. So the brain wants to minimize such surprise and error, right? Wants to minimize prediction error as much as possible. So this is where the role of affect, which is a fancy word for mood, comes in. So free energy chaos is does not feel good it will create mental pain on the other hand taking chaos and making sense of it and controlling it is rewarding and motivating and so the role of the mood whether positive or negative is to take the chaos around us and minimize it so we're constantly experiencing incoming stimuli which are inherently subject to error and imprecision the brain is constantly trying to increase precision right it's trying to Right, turn around so that you can see things more clearly. It switches. We switch the lights on to see better. We have top-down revision, so we know what the vague shape really is. Is it a cat? Is it clothes strewn on the floor? Let's listen more carefully. Oh, that's not the Beatles. It's the Beach Boys. And we recruit help. Did you hear something? Did you see something? Was I just imagining it? You know about 70s music, what was that group's name? So in this dialogue, what we're doing right now, we have created a beautiful duet, right? This is like an opera, right? And so if all these previous attempts fail, we will choose an environment that conforms to our brain's pre-existing model of the world, such as I can't stand modern music, so let's go over to classic FM. So this is called in psychoanalytic terms, projective identification. We shape our interpersonal world to conform with expectations. So you psychiatrists are all the same. You're never there when I need you. Now consider the state of depression. Right? It's typically triggered by loss. So depression, generally speaking, is an adaptive, commonsensical, normal, human sadness all right you lose something you lose a friend you lose a job you lose an opportunity right you lose connection you lose status you lose income right you're going to feel sad all right that that's normal uh, adversity is widespread all right but we want to be resilient so we need a model for the world around us and the world inside us that encompasses loss and chaos and all sorts of events and our responses to them so those who are securely attached are able to repair the inevitable ruptures, ruptures, right? The losses to which we're all prone, typically through a sequence of protest at first, then rage, then grief, then mourning, right? If you have a substantial loss, you're not going to go straight to acceptance. You're going to have always have a time for protest, a time for rage, a time for grief, and a time for mourning. So when you have these repeated losses and repair cycles, that builds resilience. So the, the understanding that help is at hand, and that's what this show is all about. Help is at hand. We're going to build new top-down models that are more sophisticated, more closer and closer approximating reality so that we increase our error minimization predictions. So insecurely attached children, that's how I grew up, are primed in later life for depression in response to loss or trauma. And so the, the input of chaos will shake up the psychological equilibrium of someone who has insecure or avoidant attachment styles. So people who have insecure attachment, like I've had most of my life, they tend to be passive rather than active. So my therapist once astutely said, I think 
I wonder if you're so radical in your politics because you're so passive in your life. So people with insecure attachment, if you're constantly worried about rejection, and that's how I've lived my life, we tend to be passive rather than active. We tend to stick with a limited and simple and inflexible top-down models of reality, such as it's no use trying to make things better. It just never works. Or feelings are dangerous. Best to keep them buried. You know, women are all bitches. Right? People with insecure attachment find it hard to trust people, and so they can't borrow an intimate other person's brain with which to process their feelings and to build up alternative ways of viewing the world. But the great news is you have come here and you've borrowed my brain and we're going to process feelings together and we're going to build up alternative ways of viewing the world. So when you're a wee lad and you were playing with your genitals, like how did your parents react? Did they, did they shame you? Right. Do you, do you feel like nothing you do matters? Right. You, you stuck in, in passivity. Ah, oh, it's just no good. I might as well give up. Well, you've got a friend. You've got a friend. All right. And so we're going to process feelings together and we're going to build up alternative ways of viewing the world that will minimize your prediction errors. So the most commonly used therapy for depression is cognitive behavioral therapy. So CBT therapists encourage patients to test their negative hypotheses. It's no good. Women are all bitches. I hate rabbis. Gay people suck. By looking more closely at your experiences and by exploring alternative top-down models to account for them. So maybe my boyfriend doesn't answer his phone because he's run out of battery, not because he doesn't love me. But cognitive behavioral therapy has its limitations. Right? Treatment-resistant depression is common. People with personality disorders, and I was diagnosed with a narcissistic personality disorder, they tend to do badly. Whoa! Ricardo Williams, a member for 20 months, says we are all at least as delusional as Luke Ford. Thank you. That's such a sweet thing to say. All right. So people with personality disorders like me tend to do badly with standard cognitive behavioral therapy. We tend to refuse to engage. We tend to drop out. So if you've got a lot of chaos going on inside of you, you're going to gravitate towards environments that confirm your view of the world, however negative. So people with depression tend to have few fulfilling relationships, right? And they tend to have stereotyped and simplistic top-down models. Do you have emotionally impoverished relationships? Do you have stereotyped and simplistic top-down models? Well, I'm glad you came here because these... These things that you think are helping you, they become a self-fulfilling hypothesis resistant to intervention, right? These negative top-down models of the world are inferentially inert, meaning they're not accessible for modification. Now, of course, we have to tolerate a degree of chaos uncertainty, right, before we can evolve new, more adaptive models of reality, right? So I'm creating a safe space, all right? And the, you get to borrow my brain along your journey for a more complex and nuanced top-down reset. So people with personality disorders such as, what are the, what are the big ones? Narcissistic personality disorder, uh, histrionic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. Okay, if you've got a personality disorder, and if you're watching the show, the odds are probably 50% you got a personality disorder, right? You find it very difficult to trust others. But you are now in a safe space. Right? Is this a slow sell for 40s method services? Ricardo says, I've been a member for 20 months. My actions speak louder than my words. All right. So let's, let's focus on fundamental change. All right. So this new model for dealing with depression, all right, we, we create a shared blanket, all right? There's a shared blanket that we're creating here. And so all those bottom-up unprocessed experiences that are causing you pain and suffering and anxiety, well, we're going to take the chaos of these un bottom-up unprocessed experiences and feelings, and we're going to find a place for them.
all right, I'm going to encourage you to develop manageable narratives. So once you get a manageable narrative for your pain and anxiety, your pain and anxiety becomes less overwhelming and you develop new adaptive ways of thinking and new ways of reorganizing your psyche. And so one of the tools that psychoanalysis has used is free association, which taps into the mind's normally unvoiced upward welling stream of consciousness. All right, this enables the range of top-down responses to be enhanced. So dreaming is a way that the mind generates new narratives, new stories with which to control the chaos that uh, life's vicissitudes inevitably engender. And looking at transference, the way you ascribe to other people all sorts of things that you don't want to face in yourself, right, that, that turns the spotlight on the limited varieties of top-down narratives that depressed people, anxious people use in their dealings with others to minimize chaos. So the enigmatic ambiguity of my persona, right? Uh, you've often said, 40, just the, the enigmatic ambiguity of your persona is just allowing me to experience, reconsider, and totally extend the top-down assumptions with which I've been approaching the world of intimate others. And, and I could not have said it better myself. So psychoanalytic and attachment-derived mentalization-based therapy. Mentalization simply means empathy, putting yourself in other people's shoes. This is a highly effective therapy for borderline personality disorder, which is previously considered untreatable, leads to big reductions in medication use, suicide attempts, hospital admission, and unemployment. So mentalization-based therapy, learning to have empathy for other people, and encourages people to identify the bottom-up feelings that fuel their self-injurious actions, enables them to pause and think of different ways of healing these confusing bottom-up feelings to, to learn to tolerate a degree of chaos with the help of the therapist's borrowed brain. And then through mutual mentalizing, right, mutual development of empathy, right, the, the therapist and the patient together form a bubble to generate more complex and adaptive models of the self and significant others in the world around us. That's what we do on this show. This show is all about generating more complex and adaptive models of ourselves, other people, and the world, and the news. And the result is we have less chaos, right? We question our negative assumptions about the world and other people. We become less overwhelmed by chaos. We have fewer meltdowns. And this facilitates greater resilience. And you say, 40, I want to know who is the genius who comes up with this. And it is Professor Jeremy Holmes. The brain has a mind of its own. Attachment, neurobiology, and the new science of psychotherapy. And you're saying, 40, what is this new science of psychotherapy? And the answer is FEP, not FAP, FEP, F-E-P, free energy principle. All right, this is a framework for understanding the fundamentals of our psychic life. All right, so the brain is constantly selecting from, attending to, shaping and maintaining homeostasis in the face of all these streams of incoming chaos, both from within and without. So you, you see what's going on in South Africa. It's, you see what's going on with Joe Biden right, for giving $500 billion worth of loans. All right, all this chaos, how do we develop more sophisticated and adaptive top-down models to explain the world around us. How do we lower our prediction errors, right? How do we become more adaptive in this constantly changing world? So our body's feelings underpin our life. And prediction errors, the discrepancies between what we want and expect and what our senses tell us is the case, right? We experience this, these discrepancies as bad or painful, right? And so we want to minimize them. Well, here's how you can minimize them. You develop more sophisticated top-down models of reality. When our expectations and our experiences align, we feel good. We feel happy. I'm happy. I feel good. My expectations and my experiences are right now aligning. Now, I'm picking up my phone and looking at the chat and... And let's see how my expectations and, and reality align. So it only cost me $60. Luke should have gotten at least half of that. Yes, thank you, Ricardo. I, <laughs> I, I'm not going to say what I spent it on. God forbid. I, I, I spent it on uh, very worthy endeavors. 
Is it possible to have an out-of-body experience while hosting a live stream? Very, very difficult because you have to keep an eye on sound levels on, on the chat, on the, on the video. I'm, I'm streaming simultaneously to six different places, all right? I'm streaming live to my Facebook page, to my Facebook profile. I'm streaming live right now to Odyssey. I am streaming live right now to DLive. I'm streaming live right now to YouTube, and I'm streaming live right now to Twitter. All right, it, it's hard to have an out-of-body experiences when all this is going down. Luke has his psychology down pat these days, says the anonymous professor. I don't even want to know how much money I spent on Super Chat, says Ricardo, at least $500. Destiny should totally disavow the Mexican leader of the white race. Okay, Art Belt, have you thrown in the link to uh, Nick Fuentes and a Jewish guy telling him not to wear strange glasses? Okay, maybe, I mean, do we really want a slum with, with Nick Fuentes content and, and Destiny content? I mean, we're up in the heavens. Like, we're having a whole new top-down experiences. We're developing, you know, a far more sophisticated models of reality to reduce our error prediction rate so that we can be happy and so that we can more increasingly align our expectations with reality. And now, really, Art Bell, really? You, you suggest that we pay attention to yeah, you think? to Nick Fuentes and, and Destiny? What do you mean? Uh, I mean, come on. I mean... Are you? Can I get the chicken and waffles also? Okay. What? I'm going with your what, what, what kind of content what? is this? Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, so I met her the other day. I met the Manic Pixie Dream Girl. We met our manic pixie dream girl and we let her get away. Oh yeah? We were walking girl. down the street and we were talking about LSD. We're like, we need to do LSD. And that girl was walking by and she looked back and she's like, I want to do LSD. <laughs> and then she disappeared. And then she, and then she walked off. And she's walked away? We should have hunted her down. And we, we thought about her every day. As a couple? Yeah. Yeah. You do that kind of thing? Yep. It's part of our degeneracy, yeah. Jeez. You know how it goes. Swingers? Well, it's part of the hypergamous God. lifestyle. For me to recruit Why do you many do that? Why do you do my, that? Well, how does that work possible? exactly? You're, so you're in an open relationship. It's kind of, yeah. I'm not going to browbeat you like Alex Stein Go ahead, did. yeah. Tuck it up. I'm not, I'm not going to browbeat you about it, but what, what's what's going on with that? What's the story? How about just one man, one woman, together forever? We just like to fuck other people. Why? Why do you, do you watch Why do you mask? No, he probably doesn't. No, no he doesn't. Never, we're we're never anti porn. We're anti porn. You are? Oh yeah, we what think do do? porn should be banned. You come? I'm an asexual yeah. incel. Really? Yeah. So we don't don't play. Homie, don't play. <laughs> I'm about. I'm married to the business. Okay. But um. So wait, what is like the most intimacy that you can do in that case? What is that? I don't know. Handshakes, hugs. Uh, is that what it is? This maybe. <laughs> the Something most intimate like thing you've ever experienced. No, I, I kissed a girl once. You did? Yeah. When you I liked it? 14. I was sort of indifferent. I was impartial. Oh. But uh, I'll have to I'll have to make so it happen. So I can have a kid. What's up? Done. They're just serious. That's true. Thank God it was so a bear. Glasses aren't that serious. Wear something like this. Yeah. Are you Jewish by any chance? Why would you? Irish guy. Okay. Oh, based. Now it gave it away. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Cheers to you. Yeah. Why are you another Jew? No. No, I'm like you. I'm Irish and Italian. Oh, well, Yeah. These are right. cool glasses, all right? They are cool. But they're not going to take you serious if you have to care. You got to show your eyes, brother. All right. Good, yeah. eyes. good advice. Good yeah, all right. God bless. Yeah, you too, buddy. See ya. What if he was Jewish? I he looked a little Jewish. I don't well, know you're if gonna he was a right. What if he was like, yeah, I am. What about it? Man, I was dropping such pearls of wisdom, really. And you wanted me to interrupt my, my show for, for such triviality? I mean, I, I was I was sharing like absolutely life changing material here, and and my God, my God, but but I need to become empathic. You must have been coming from a place of great pain when you thought that was compelling content. So I have to try to get inside of your your mind and your head and and realize like what kind of pain and trauma led you to believe that that was great content. And so I need to have empathy for for your suffering and for what you've been through and, and how you've been wired biologically, genetically, experientially. Okay, chaos has an ambiguous role. It provides the vital information, the sustenance needed for our evolution. 
for our adaptation, survival, and reproduction. It forms the basis for creativity. But without boundaries, all right, chaos can overwhelm our unprepared nervous system. So when you have chaos, you want to try to bring it under control. That's what motivates us. That's what makes us tick. That's what makes us exploit what we have and explore and want to know more and to think up better top-down models of reality. Failure to do so is demotivating, degenerating, and depressing. So the brain is constantly building up a repertoire of survival scenarios to match the likely risk with which we will be confronted in the course of our lifetime. So prediction error minimization is continuously finessed against novelty so that we can go through life and continually improve and adapt. So when we control chaos, that is rewarding. We get a dopamine burst when we feel like we have some agency and influence over our life. When we lack motivation, right, when we lack a sense of agency, right, we will be unhappy. And this will often lead to psychological illness. So psychotherapy creates a duet for one. All right, that's what we're doing right now. We're singing a beautiful song together where in our interactions right now, surprise is okay. It is ultimately pleasurable. All right, let the tears flow because the tears that we shed on this show are healing tears. All right, so how do we build up prediction error minimizing, PEM? Right? So we ask, should I look a little closer to make sure or should I assume the worst and run away? Right? That's a secure attachment response. That's a balanced attempt to match input with a possibly generative model of the world. So in a UK park, the stick is most likely not a snake. In an Indian paddy field, what looks like a stick may very well be a snake. Now, a less secure response to seeing something that looks like a snake in a, in a big city park would be hyperactivation, right? Anxious attachment. Treat all sticks as snakes or all homosexuals, they've all got monkeypox, all right? all right? That's an insecure response, all right? Or the hypoactivation or avoidant attachment. Forget snakes, stick to sticks, all right? Let's just forget everybody, F them, all right? That, that, these strategies are understandable once you understand the individual's developmental context, right? The, the person who thought that Destiny Nick Fuentes fan interaction was just, you know, compelling entertainment. Well, you can't judge that, that person. You can't judge Art Bell until you have stepped inside his genetics, his biology, and his developmental context, right? But this anxious or avoidant response is understandable, but it's maladaptive in the present moment, right? The anxious attachment response leads towards anxiety and depression and avoidance leads to fatal risk-taking so look in the world there are orchids and dandelion so i'm an orchid right about 20 percent of the people are orchids so people like me are hyper responsive so in favorable environments i flourish in unfavorable ones i wither and die so dandelions relatively insensitive to environmental influence they they do less well than orchids in good environments, but are more impervious to unfavorable influences. So a friend of mine says, I tell people I'm a sports car, not a Jeep. I'm not an all weather, all conditions, reliable, all terrain vehicle. I am fickle. I need maintenance. But if the road is clear, I can make up years of ground on people, but I will get caught in the mud and the rain. I am not as resilient as normal people. And so let me go to the chat. There's no such thing as a suicide attempt. It's clearly a call for attention. You failed at the most basic task. Destiny looks very manly versus the boyish Fuentes who looks quiet, thin, and frail. Cold showers will prepare you for these tough times, Luke. Good evening to all the loyal followers of patron St. Luke. May he teach us all the mysteries of life says Jim Bowden finish the clip don't pee pee finish the clip like how how much longer do you want me to play the clip I mean I am dropping truth bombs I am sharing with you life-changing information I am offering you more adaptive top-down hypotheses about life right I I'm helping you become more effective with your prediction prediction error minimization all right so here's a story fine spring morning 
Blokes going for a daily run across farmland. He noticed this is that the farmer has recently sprayed weed killer. There's an unpleasant, sickly smell, makes him slightly nausea, brings to mind a mild feeling of illness that he'd had the previous year. Next day, same place, the smell is gone, but he noticed in his peripheral vision a dark, flapping object. So his first thought, this is a bird, a crow, affected by yesterday's poison. So he turns his head to engage his central vision, approaches to investigate further, and if necessary, rescue the bird. The closer he comes, however, to the putative stricken bird reveals itself to be no more than a fragment of a wind-blown black plastic part of a discarded fertilizer bag. So this trivial incident illustrates a number of key principles, Bayesian principles, free energy principles, right? One, this is life. The stimulus is frequently ambiguous, right? Therefore, subject to high levels of error and chaos, potentially chaos, right? The priors that we have, right? Our past experiences attribute to the present experience based on a selective sampling in our peripheral vision together with record interoceptive nausea leading to a top-down construct of a sick bird. So we've got a memory-based construction of an ambiguous stimulus that is... An example of transference. To resolve the ambiguity, the free energy minimization requires action. You turn your head and move towards the flapping object to reduce the noise and increase the precision of your sensory sampling. Then you have a hypothesis revision. The poison will have dispelled by today, so it'd be odd if the bird was still affected. Then you have active interference leading to a stable posterior. We have a free energy chaos minimizing representation of reality, suddenly flapping plastic and internal, no nausea, no illness. So we've got two possibilities in this ambiguous situation. We have a sick bird or a plastic bag, and the latter prevailed. So the sense of chaos we had has become controlled. So parents who are good at mentalizing, meaning develop empathy tend to have secure infants because they readily put themselves in the child's shoes they see that what from an adult perspective might seem trivial to a small child might feel dangerous and trigger abandonment anxiety so parents understanding and resonating with their infants moods all right that makes the infant feel more secure so i am here to understand and to resonate with your moods Right. People with personality disorders, which have uh, plagued me most of my life, are typically on a hair trigger for overwhelming anxiety. So for people like me, over the course of my life, fast rather than slow thinking is the norm. So I've lived most of my life in the grip of perceptual distortion and ingrained prediction errors. I've been driven by the need to try to control chaos into a modicum of predictability. So therapy can help with re-establishing biobehavioral synchronicity. The more disturbed the individual, the more difficult this is. Trust is a fragile and fluctuating flower which will vary from show to show, moment to moment within a show. So we're here to identify, understand, and overcome obstacles to feeling at ease in the world. And until you feel at ease with the work we're doing here, it's just not gonna be effective. So it's counterproductive to try to argue with people, to try to argue them out of their delusions. You have to accept the validity of other people's experience. That's a precondition for progress. So psychosis represents dysfunction in a top-down prediction error minimization. And autism is the opposite. Autism is enslavement to the senses. So autism means you don't think enough about other people's motivations and moods and emotions and with wait what's the opposite of of, <laughs> of, of autism oh what are those crazy people you know muttering to themselves uh, on the street they attribute you know far more to reality than than is really there wow luke is listing chat in the stream must be multi-streaming we need the viewers to comment on kevin michael grace Last survival video showing 5.30 and demand that he show up here in Luke Land, USA. Luke needs those Fuentes shades. Top to bottom hypotheses. Finish the clip, 40. Finish the clip. Come on, what's the opposite of autism? What's that other major mental illness, right? There's autism and, you know, psychosis. Uh, uh, most homeless people have it. Damn. 
Okay, psychosis. You give too much weight to your top-down inferences. You give that that's psychosis, right? And then when you have autism, you give too much weight to your bottom-up sensations. And if you've experienced significant trauma, you're not able to bring to bear the full ex life experience because it's been repressed. So if you repress what's going on inside of you, that leads to depression. Now, difficulty with recruiting other people in duets for one, right? We're, we're building a beautiful song here, right? That produces a go it alone, maladaptive approach to life, which will be filled with substance abuse, suicidal acts, and personality disorders, right? Failure to reduce complexity, right? Not being able to to have effective hypotheses for life that also leads to personality disorders and inhibition of action, obsessive compulsive disorders. So schizophrenia, thanks, schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is where you read too much into what's going on with other people and autism is where you don't read enough into what's going on with other people. Okay, blessings. Surely love is all around us. All right, mental illness and diseases of social brains, right? So evolution has produced natural and culturally mediated repair systems to reverse our mental illnesses. So to stave off chaos, living systems have evolved defenses which resist chaos, maintain structure, and enhance adaptation and survival. So we have defenses that operate all the way up from the cells of the immune system through our interpersonal attachment dynamic to social structures, right, ranging from social care to tidal barriers to military hardware. So these are initially involuntarily involuntary and automatic, but they become goal-directed goal social formations. So we share our immune systems with fellow mammals, but our high-density communities, urbanization, and migration mean that we need vaccination and immunization programs to augment our capacity to outwit disease. So dreaming helps to rework potentially traumatic free energy so that the associated terror can be controlled and the accompanying mental pain made more tolerable and less disruptive by developing narratives about what's happening. So top-down inferences, right? More sophisticated ways of understanding reality, right? That will control the chaos and reduce maladaptive future fears, right? So we can generate more sophisticated models for how the world works and thus reduce prediction error. When we reduce our prediction error, when we reduce the space between what we expect and what we experience, we're going to feel happier and more effective. So we can never escape the emotional pain of loss, separation, and death. But if we can meet these imposters with effective top-down hypotheses, we will safeguard or postpone the disappointment that comes with realizing that we have significant prediction errors. So one novice therapist announced during her coffee break, I finally realized that transference is real. My first patient today described me as a hideous witch. The second said I was a beautiful angel. Leah Greenfield thinks that all the major Western mental health diagnoses, bipolar, schizophrenia, autism, the same condition, which politically changed in the West. Yes, she sees them as a result of uh, freedom the freedom that comes with, with nationalism. So reactions to Tony Fauci are often transference for people's feelings about government bureaucratic power, right? If you have an inherent distrust of uh, government bureaucratic power, then, right, then you're very likely to have a negative feeling about Tony Fauci. So let's have a look at uh, Fox News. Federal officials now have until noon tomorrow to make this affidavit public. Here now with the very latest Fox News contributor, Jonathan Turley. Jonathan, thanks for being here. You know how to break this stuff down. We could get this redacted <laughs> affidavit at any moment. We were preparing on this show to potentially release it. Will we be, will we be waiting until noon? And what do you think we'll see? 
Well, we could be waiting until noon. I must admit I'm skeptical. You know, this was the same department that said that not a single word of this redacted, uh, of this affidavit should be released. And on the first uh, attempt, uh, they were able to miraculously hit the Goldilocks point of getting it just right, because it appears that the hmm. judge did not push back on any sections. And, and for those of us who've litigated against this department over over redactions and over classifications, uh, there is a certain degree of skepticism that uh, left to its own devices, they maximized what could be released. But I'm still grateful that something will be released. I'm hoping, truly, that Attorney General Garland saw that the earlier position was wrong. And he went to the department and said, let's try to be as transparent as possible. I mean, after all, this affidavit doesn't likely contain a lot of good sections for Donald Trump. Affidavits aren't like that. This is, these are one-sided accounts uh, that make the case for uh, searches and seizures. Uh, so it's not like I'm, I'm worried that they are only redacting uh, the, stu the stuff that's good for Donald Trump. Uh, but I, I'm hoping that they see this as a moment to break from tradition, to have greater transparency, and we will see tomorrow. So the reflex from the DOJ would probably be to take a page full of words and make it nothing. But you're saying potentially there's an incentive from the DOJ because of the blowback to, you know, redacting names. Okay, let's get back to... Let's get back to the good stuff, all right? I'm with you, mate. I'm with you. All right. To be effective in life, we have to take into account other people. We have to take into account the views and the motivations of others. We have to factor in our own psychology and our own views and how our words and actions and just our being will be perceived by other people, right? So in urban life it's rare that opposing pedestrians in a busy street bump into each other we, we're constantly making unconscious predictions about the direction of travel of others and of ourselves and usually these things run smoothly now if you bump into someone in la in certain parts of town this could be very very dangerous but uh, you bump into someone in australia and oh sorry i'm terribly sorry all right so Let's say something happened to you today, like your boss yelled at you, all right? So you experience what your boss did and you compare it to past experiences. You want to identify and modify both your top-down hypotheses about life and your bottom-up feelings. So with enhanced sensory sampling, we begin to tease out the differences and automatic assumptions that these things evoke. And we may notice, oh, you know, in childhood, I was constantly afraid of being abandoned by, by my parent. And so I'm now projecting the same fear of abandonment into a different interaction. So if we bring some scrutiny to the events of the day, this can lead to a more realistic model about what's going on. Now, if you have an avoidant attachment, you're going to be more resistant to free association. But people will typically feel calmed by you know, Forty's presence or a therapist's presence. So people with anxious attachment styles typically feel overwhelmed by the uprush of their inner feelings, their interoceptive, the feelings that come within them, their hormonal and uh, sensory feelings. So the job of free association for people like me is to slow things down so that we can identify what we're feeling and then subject our feelings to rational top-down scrutiny. So we can consider the possibility that my horrible stomach pain that I get whenever, you know, my friend goes on a trip doesn't necessarily mean gut cancer. So therapists help us own our actions to be better able to distinguish between those of our actions which we are responsible for and those of our actions in which we are victims. So we develop feelings of autonomy and enhance influence and control over our lives. So insecure attachments are vulnerability factors for psychological illness because they compromise active interference in our own lives. So without an external, internal, secure base from which to explore, all right, we don't tend to explore much in life. We're going to limit our participation in life. So 
when we have anxious attachments such as dog me, our agency, our sense of control and direction over our life tends to be absent or eroded. We tend not to actively search or change our environment. We tend to remain passive in the face of loss, conflict, and trauma. You can call this state learned helplessness. So we are overwhelmed by what's going on inside of us. And we will typically be committed to a single prior hypothesis of hopelessness. Right? Nothing I do will ever change anything. And this precludes finding ways to live productively in our environment and inhibits the testing of alternative hypotheses, right? Maybe if I try this, things won't be so bad after all. So if you go to a show where everyone reinforces your, your political perspective that, you know, America is going to hell, then you're not likely to try out alternative hypotheses. So think about tennis player John McEnroe's famous challenge to the empire, umpire, right? McEnroe said, you cannot be serious in calling a ball out that John McEnroe was convinced was in. So with the psychological sophistication you developed on today's show, you could argue back, neither of us can be absolutely certain whether that ball was on or off the line. Perceptions are inherently subject to error. Tennis balls fly faster than nerve impulses transmit. Your error minimization procedure is informed by your interoceptive signals of desire to win the match. Your fury is an acting out of that desire. It is a manifestation of chaos. I, on the other hand, have no vested interest who, in who wins this game. My error minimization procedure is fueled neither by amygdala-driven fear of failure nor wish for dopamine reward. So the rules of tennis require that you borrow my brain in inherently ambiguous situations such as this. My final and considered decision, therefore, is the ball was out. So think about the word conversation, right? It has implications of togetherness, con, and opposition versus, right? That, that points to the essence of psychotherapy. It's about acceptance and challenge. That's what this show is all about. It's a conversation. It's about acceptance, radical love and inclusion, and challenge. So conversation includes the ideas of a home, and it also includes ideas of sexual intercourse. So by providing a home, therapists or 40 offer a sense of safety and attention needed to explore and rework one's deepest dispositions. And sex points to the arousal of intersubjectivity. That means your own internal feelings and other people's feelings. Mutuality, right? We're, we're, we're both stimulating each other in, in an intellectual and moral way. Complementarity, that we're building things together. And somo, somatopsychic excitement, right? And uh, good therapy calls all this into being. So if sex is a conversation and conversation is a form of sex, so too is attachment. Now, people who suffer from depression are in the thrall of cognitive errors that are dominating their mood, such as everyone hates me, I am useless, nothing I do will work, the Democrats suck, all homosexuals have monkeypox, no, I, I hate working around, you know, people of a certain ethnicity, right? These are self-perpetuating, spurious, parsimonious generalizations that create chaos and undermine a sense of agency that you can have influence over your life. This is learned helplessness, all right? You go on most distant right streams and you learn learned helplessness because you're told that the Jews run the world and essentially there's nothing you can do just uh, rage against the, the dying of the light. More information about why they did it. So, it, I mean, I, I, I'm prepared for a, a sheet of full black, Jonathan, and, and you're telling me maybe sure. we'll get actual information here. Well, this is really the exercise of hope over experience because I've been in some heated <laughs> litigation. This department is infamous for using redactions and classifications for tactical purposes. I have been in cases where uh, they have overredacted to a ridiculous degree. Judges often defer to them. But I, you know, I, I recently noted in a piece that there have been four occasions where the attorney general could have taken modest steps to assure the public that this was 
was not a political, a politically motivated effort and failed to do so. This is the fifth. Yeah. And he can really reverse course. Um, you can't just demand that the public trust his department. OK, let's get back to the good stuff. All right, so here's a session here where a woman with anorexia is being interviewed by a senior psychiatrist. And so the psychiatrist asks her, do you worry about your appearance? And she responds, oh, no, they're fine. I never think about my parents, right? So she's asked about her appearance, but because she thinks so often about her parents, she hears your appearance as my parents. So conversation is a key part of therapy. So therapy helps people develop language about their feelings, which can give form and description to their suffering. So by listening to your body and to your feelings and finding words with which to express, manage, and live with your feelings. So please use your words right now in the chat. Tell me what you are feeling. Tell me what's going on inside of you. Tell me what's going on outside of you. Use your words. So when you use your words, you develop a more feeling of autonomy and, and influence and agency. So as we develop more sophisticated models of reality, we minimize surprise and chaos. So the main function of the brain is to minimize surprise and we do this in two main ways through action all right we reduce prediction errors by selectively sampling sensations that are least surprising and perception all right we change perceptions after we experience something or we learn about something so the key features of the psychoanalytic approach, free association, dreams, sexuality, reflective discourse, transference, and mentalizing, which means empathy, or depend on decoupling, meaning introducing play into the bottom-up, top-down, surprise minimization strategies of everyday life. So you get a therapist who is modulating, moderating, and affect buffering, right? Meaning buffering your moods, right? Chaos surprise becomes more tolerable and when it is therapeutically scrutinized we can extend our emotional and mental repertoire and develop a range of counterfactual realities right we interpreted events only in certain set ways now we can develop more sophisticated and accurate interpretations of what's going on inside and outside of us so the greater the range of prior hypotheses the greater the opportunity for error minimized binding and the less the need to resort to rigid limited or anachronistic top-down hypotheses right so we want to develop more and more hypotheses about life that are sophisticated so this will enhance our adaptation to our particular life right our, our top-down model becomes more accurate by continually revising our beliefs and reducing complexity, particularly with regard to conflict and trauma. So psychological ill health means simple, simplistic top-down models and restrictions of how much we sample the world, how restrictions on our sensory sampling. Right? The more structured complexity we use, right, that's a mark of psychological health. So psychotherapy increases our repertoire of models of ourselves and of the world around us. So the task of the therapist is to challenge the patient to break the mold of their maladaptive, simplistic, top-down models and move towards more complex and adaptive models of reality. So much of the benefits from therapy depends on the attachment of the client and the therapist. So I would have therapists who'd say, do you, do you really want to connect with me? Because I'd be just kind of talking at them like I was talking to a wall. So insecurely attached people and avoidantly attached people tend to rebuff attempts at creating intimacy and connection. So 
If you're insecurely attached, avoidantly attached, your conversation will tend to be non-relational. I was just treating my therapist as an object, right? I wasn't emotionally engaged and I would fall into these repetitive patterns. So these impasses created by repetitive patterns and simplistic top-down models will often become the focus of therapy. So when you have very painful prediction errors about reality, that indicates there's this substantial misalignment between your wishes and reality. And these misalignments can become chronic and embedded. So psychotherapy is a way to resolve this impasse. The, the therapist will enjoin the client to look at and to mentalize what is happening between them to develop empathy for this growing relationship. So when the therapist hold, so to speak, the, the client pr produces a container for the client's fears and anxiety, then the client can calm down, become more secure, and then be more adventurous. So what we develop on this show is a duet for one, right? We, we are singing to each other. And by so doing, we are widening the range of available top-down models of the world and its possibilities. Anything happened to Kevin Michael Grace, I believe. He got a series of strikes on YouTube and he's looking for another model to do his show. I could see Luke advocating for harsher penalties for Kevin Michael Grace. God forbid, not at all. Not at all. Kevin's uh, welcomed, welcomed on, on this show. I hope he gets his, uh, his show back soon. Ken Brown took down a bunch of videos. So he's sending things out more often on Telegram. Wow, thank you for the sharing. <laughs> Any thoughts on the whist Twitter whistleblower? Well, it sounds like he's highly competent. Admit at 40, you are single, no woman will tolerate your bald head. The Mr. Clean look, you need an earring or two. We've got a world famous hacker in the chat. Odyssey seems a viable streaming alternative. Yes, I think Kevin Michael Gray should get on Odyssey. Okay, I wanted to play a little bit from Brian McClenahan. It essentially capitulates to the executive nature of American government. The only important election is the presidential election. And every two years we have the midterms because we're just worried about the presidential election. In reality, the that election is more important than the presidential election, at least it should be. And of course, we have a lot of other elections going on in 2022, governors, state legislatures, all of these things are important, more important than the presidency. But we know with executive government, and we've seen it just this week with uh, with Joe Biden and the use of executive power with student loans, for example, we know essentially that what Americans want is not just executive government, but monarchical government. They want the president to go in and simply with the swish of a pen, change policy in America. And this doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, that's what you want. You want the president to act as a monarch, as a king. And we treat the presidents this way. Now, we're also seeing it, of course, with the situation with Trump and what's happening with the FBI and all the documents they seized. According to the information now, Trump is uh, was trying to hide behind uh, executive privilege for, for a while. And Biden blew that out of the water. Biden is the one who essentially said, no, I'm not going to support this. You got to go and get these documents. So we have a very interesting situation developing between the current administration and the previous administration over executive privilege and power. This is unheard of. I mean, we've had some similar situations in American history, but not to this extent. And I think the the only time you can kind of compare that we had this much uh, animosity and antagonism between the outgoing administration and the new administration was maybe 1801 when you had Jefferson coming in and Adams leaving. But Jefferson... Okay, I just read this extraordinary article in the Wall Street Journal. It's an excerpt from a forthcoming book. It is the most compelling thing I've read in the Wall Street Journal uh, for years. Inside the investigation that secured a guilty plea for 84 wildfire deaths, neglect, shoddy record keeping, and overlooked warnings added up to a crime, not an accident. It's by 
journalist Catherine Blunt. And this article is an excerpt from a forthcoming book coming out August 30th, California Burning, the Falling, the Fall of Pacific Gas and Electric and What It Means for America's Power Grid by Wall Street Journal Energy reporter Catherine Inside Blunt. the investigation that secured a guilty plea for 84 wildfire deaths. Neglect, shoddy record-keeping, and overlooked warnings added up to a crime, not an accident. By Catherine Blunt August 25, 2022, 10 a.m. Eastern Time A brilliant flash broke the morning darkness on November 8, 2018, as strong winds pummeled a power line scaling the Sierra Nevada Mountains 90 miles north of Sacramento, California, a worn hook hanging from a century-old transmission tower owned by PG&E Corp. Broke clean, dropping a high-voltage wire that spit electricity just before sunrise. A shower of sparks set dry brush aflame. PG&E recorded an outage on the line at 6.15 a.m. The message reached the local fire station at 6.29 a.m. Two engines sped north along a remote road running up a steep river canyon that funnels mountain winds down to the valley below. Within 15 minutes, they arrived on the east bank of the Feather River, opposite the makings of a firestorm. There was no way to get ahead of it. The transmission tower perched high along a steep, gravelly access. Okay, so this is the fire in paradise. And because of uh, one broken bolt and uh, just fascinating story, here's the, the reporter. That it's really something I wanted to do since I was very young. I was the, I'm the consummate high school journalism nerd. And then I went to college and studied journalism and history also. But um, I knew that I wanted to be a reporter. And after school, I started at the Express News in San Antonio. I covered transportation, which was a lot of fun. It was a great beat to have right out of school. I mean, San Antonio is a big city but has um, a very small town feel. So it's good to kind of get to know everybody and understand how they were addressing these you know, issues of, of urban development as uh, the population grew and uh, really exciting. And then I moved to the Houston Chronicle and I was a business reporter there for almost three years um, and covered a wide range of subjects, um, perhaps most notably uh, the deep dive into the business of Joel Osteen's megachurch. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> and what are, are these like, features? Do you spend like months digging into it? Like how does, yeah. how does this type of reporting differ than Right. Or, yeah, just actually walk through like the basics of reporting even to us. Like what are sure. the different types of articles? Absolutely. I mean, there are a number of different kinds. A lot of what you read on the day to day is stuff that takes maybe less than a day to, to write or maybe a couple of days, depending on um, the, the nature of the subject. But the ones that are the most fun to me are the ones that take really months of talking to people and digging through documents. And, um, you know, so you do that for quite a long period of time. And then sometimes the editing process can take almost as long, kind of depending yeah. on uh, depending on the subject. And so in this case, this was a kind of a three part series and it was um it was it was a feature really i mean it was feature writing so there, there's like a, almost a different element there and making it read as nicely as it is uh you know deeply reported so um that was a lot of fun um and you know you flex a different set of muscles when you do that kind of work and um and so then i uh, joined the wall street journal in november of 2018 just a few days before the uh, campfire i was hired to cover renewable energy utilities and so all of a sudden the largest story in the utility world and one of the most significant stories in the u.s is is happening like in real time, you know. With this. And where was the campfire for audience? I'm sorry, it was Northern California. It was um, it, was, it destroyed the town of Paradise in the Sierra foothills, and so um, pretty. It was pretty uh, soon after the fire started that it became clear that it was likely caused by one of PG&E's power lines. And how did they know that? Like, what makes that so clear? Yeah. So um, when the utility experiences a, a disruption on one of its lines, it has to file a report with regulator that indicates what the problem might have been, and um, you know you can't. You can't draw a definitive conclusion um, at that point in time that the power line started the fire, but um, it, you know you can kind of read between the lines. It takes a few more months before the uh, state um, you know, fire officials finish their investigation, but in this case, uh, it was pretty evident from the start, and so it launched what became more than a year of reporting on this company, wow. um, so, which with two very close colleagues of mine. And just, um, so what, it work what's your structure on something that? And okay, first let me ask the question: Did you know that it was going to take a year, or is it something that just kind of like built and built and built? Um, I think going into it, we were basically given um, the directive to just look look as much as you can, go as deep as you can on this company so that we can explain to our readers what they're... Yes, uh, Catherine Blunt, she does look like a young Helen Hunt. Does, uh, it's so rare that, that uh, print, print, female print journalists are, are gorgeous, right? Because it, journalism tends to be a grubby profession, but here is someone who's grateful, uh, gracious... Uh, elegant the roots of the problems are here and it's not a simple story and i think it was i think we knew that it was going to take 
a long time. And you know, shortly after that fire started, the PG and sought bankruptcy protection. So you know you've got a protracted process there, and you can follow that through to the end. And to the extent that you can bring to light some of the historical dynamics that, that led to the circumstances, you know, you're, you're doing public service. And what happens like in the newsroom? Like, do you tell your editor like, hey, like I got to shuffle my like? Do you still work on other articles, or how do you how, how do you shuffle your own like responsibilities at that point mm -hmm. where you're about to like dig into something big? Mm -hmm. Well. Um, I certainly still had responsibility for just sort of the, the daily um, news that would come forth about PG&E and, and whatever it was doing, kind of you know filings. Um, you know, our bankruptcy team took care of a lot of the, the bankruptcy-related news, but as it related to issues with the regulator, different hearings, um, they are on um, criminal probation related to another issue, a gas pipeline explosion in 2010. There was some Okay, so just a, a terrific excerpt in the Wall Street Journal, incredibly compelling story. Her book's coming out in five days. That will do it. Bye-bye.